Hi again, and welcome back to another lecture on universal algebra and lattice theory. As always, we start off with the part where I arduously attempt to get myself situated to share my screen and annotate through Zoom because I'm too lazy to set up anything more sophisticated. All right, so here we go. <laughs> Uh, let's talk about the distributive and modular laws, which are laws which hold in some lattices, but not necessarily in all of them. So today's topics are, first of all, the definition of distributivity and modularity. Then the relationship between distributivity and modularity will be addressed. After that, we'll talk about dualizing distributivity. And then two very special non-distributive lattices uh, that will be important to our study of uh, distributivity and modularity. Then we'll have a result from Dedekind on modularity, after which we'll have a result from Birkhoff on distributivity, those two names not uh, being very surprising to us at this point in the series, hopefully. And then finally, we'll have an aside about graph theory, of all things, and I'll have a little bit of a, a comment about a graph theory situation, which is relatable. So, as always, we're going to start off with some definitions. And so, first of all, a distributive lattice is a lattice L, which satisfies the following identity x meet y join z is the same as x meet y join x meet z for any x, y, and z that we choose in our lattice L. Now, the reason that this is called distributivity is because this identity says that if we want to take x and meet it with a join of two things, we can distribute that x into this join so that it becomes x meet y and x meet z join together. In other words, uh, this is exactly like the situation where in a ring we have x times y plus c and we have that that's the same as x times y plus x times z. In other words, this is just like how multiplication in a ring distributes over addition in that ring. And so we can think of meet like multiplication in this situation, and we can think of join like addition. So it happens that in any lattice, we actually always have the x meet y, or x, <laughs> x meet y join z, where we take the join first, is greater than or equal to x meet y join x meet z. So uh, one way to verify this statement is uh, to First of all, uh, notice that if we have x meet y, then x meet y is going to be the greatest lower bound of x and y. So if we have x and y up here, then actually x meet y is the greatest of all the lower bounds of those two guys. But then y actually is uh, less than or equal to y join z, because y join z is the least upper bound of y and z. So certainly y is less than or equal to that. If I draw my, my sort of Hasse diagram over here. And so then if x meet y is below x and is also below y join z, that means that x meet y is a lower bound with that less than or less than less than <laughs> notation there. x meet y is a lower bound for x and y join z. And so that means that x meet y must be less than or equal to the greatest lower bound of x and y join z, but that is nothing other than x meet y join z. So now x meet y is less than or equal to x meet y join z, which is the left-hand side here. Okay, 
So now an identical argument, replacing y with z, switching the roles of y and z here, will show us that x meet z is less than or equal to x meet y join z, just swapping the role of y and z in the argument here. And so if x meet y and x meet z are both less than or equal to x meet y join z, well, then what we're going to have is that their least upper bound of these two guys is going to be less than or equal to x meet y join z. So why is that? Well, so here we have, here we have x meet y join z by our previous argument. And then we have x meet y, we have x meet y, and we have x meet z. So we know that the join of x meet y and x meet z is going to be not only an upper bound for x meet y and x meet z, but it's going to be the least upper bound. Well, x meet y join z is an upper bound for these two guys. And so the least upper bound must lie below that some other upper bound. And so that's why this inequality holds or this relationship holds. So uh, this could also have been phrased entirely algebraically as we discussed before, because saying, um, for example, that, um, well, maybe I'll use different variables. So saying that A meet um, B equals C is, um, or well, I guess I'll say it like this. So saying like A, A meet B equals A is the same thing is saying that A is less than or equal to B. And so we can actually rephrase uh, this expression in terms of just the meet and join operations of our lattice. But as we mentioned previously, it's often very helpful to uh, juggle back and forth between the two different uh, views of a lattice as a poset with its partial ordering and a lattice as an algebraic structure. And so in this argument that this relationship holds, we actually used both of those views in order to make the statement and also used them in order to argue that it had to be the case for any lattice. Okay, so that was a good exercise to start to see how, uh, how we can actually make use of some of these relationships. But if we go back to the definition of distributivity, we see that if this always holds that x meet y join z is greater than or equal to x meet y join x meet z, then if we wanna check that a lattice is distributive, we really only need to show the opposite, the opposite relationship. Because by the properties of a partial ordering, if uh, this side is greater than or equal to this side and this side is less than or equal to this side, then they must be the same thing which is precisely what distributed, distributivity says happens for all x, y, and z in our lattice. Okay. Okay, let's see why I am not able to click for some reason. There we go. All right, so now let's introduce the other algebraic property uh, we would like to talk about for lattices. So we say that a lattice is modular when given any y in our lattice, we have that z is less than or equal to x, means that x meet y join z is the same as x meet y join z, where I've swapped the parentheses. So remember that although meet and join by themselves, our associative operations, we have to be careful with our parentheses when mixing them together because in general, x meet y join z is not the same as x meet y join z, where the intonation in my voice is indicating what I've written here that the parentheses are grouped differently. So uh, 
this modular law is a little, uh, maybe a little stranger uh, to write out or to say at first. So basically it says that uh, when we have some z that's below x, then when we have x meet y join z, we can swap the order of, uh, we can swap these parentheses or associate them around, associate uh, with uh, some scare quotes around it um, for, any, for any y in our lattice. And so uh, just as we had for um, distributivity, one direction is always, is always true in the sense that if we have z less than or equal to x, we still need this condition, then in any lattice, whether it's modular or not, we have x meet y join z is greater than or equal to x meet y join z. And I encourage you to perform a similar verification of that fact. Uh, and you can use the one that I just did for uh, the always true direction on distributivity as a, as a guide. But it's a similar, it's a similar idea. You can make a similar argument for this one happening in any lattice at all. So if we want to check that a lattice is modular, it suffices to show that for all z less than or equal to x, we have x meet y join z is less than or equal to x meet y join z. Because we know, based on an argument which I encourage you to provide, that this direction is always true uh, in any lattice. Okay, so we have these two properties. Uh, one is a little more familiar to us. The other one's a little bit stranger. Distributivity is similar to things we've maybe seen more before in algebra. Modularity is maybe a little more alien at this point. Uh, so we actually have uh, the following relationship between distributivity and modularity, namely that every distributive lattice is modular. So distributivity implies modularity. Everything that's distributive must also be modular. And we give the proof of that now. So suppose that L is a distributive lattice, so distributive should be an assumption there, but sometimes we get lazy and it says in the proposition that we're showing every distributive lattice is modular. So of course, if I introduce some lattice right at the beginning, it's obviously going to be distributive. In any case, let's take L to be a distributive lattice with X, Y, and Z elements of our lattice so that Z lies below X. So we can use distributivity since we're assuming it to say that x meet y join z is the same as x meet y join x meet z. Since z is less than or equal to x, we have that x meet z is equal to z. And so x meet y join z is the same as x meet y join x meet z, but this thing is just actually z. And so we have that x meet y join z is the same as x meet y join z. But that's what we wanted to show under the assumption that z was less than or equal to x. And so uh, we do indeed have that this distributive lattice L also satisfies that modular law. Okay. So modular lattices are a special kind of distributive lattice. Now, uh, here's a question which is not so interesting for rings, but turns out to be more interesting for lattices. Uh, well, we have that a distributive lattice is one for which meet distributes over join. And so we were thinking of that like the same way that multiplication distributes over addition in a ring. What can we say about lattices for which join distributes over meet? Okay, so uh, this isn't maybe as exciting of a question to ask for rings. Uh, you might not find too many rings for which addition uh, distributes over multiplication, or at least not too many that you're excited about. Um, but let's, uh, let's ask this question for lattices. What, uh, what can we say about those for which join distributes over meet? And so if you've never seen this, 
and you don't know the answer, I encourage you to pause somewhere during the sentence of mine and see if you can figure out uh, at least a guess or something as to what the relationship will be. Uh, it's often a good exercise to stop at some point and try to figure out the answer to a uh, question yourself or the way that something will go when you don't exactly know how it's going to be done or what's going to happen. Okay. Oh, and asking these questions yourself too is also very, very important in actually engaging with the math that you're learning. All right, well, here's the answer. So if you didn't pause before, it's too bad. <laughs> See, here it is. So it actually turns out that a lattice L is distributive if and only if L satisfies this dual distributive identity. X join Y meet Z is the same as X join Y meet X join Z. So in a ring, this would be analogous to having that X plus Y times Z like this. We usually don't write the parenthesis. Oh, that plus sign is a disaster. Let's, let's try this again. So in a ring, this would be analogous to having X plus Y times Z. We usually don't write the parentheses, but let's do it here just to see the similarity. This would be like having X plus Y times Z is the same thing as X, no, X plus Y <laughs> times X plus Z. And that, that seems a little, a little bit, a little bit odd. That seems like there might be some, something uh, pretty, pretty unusual about having that, having that situation occur. But uh, in, la in lattices, it actually turns out that, that having something like multiplication, namely meet, distribute over something that's like addition, namely join, actually is the same thing as them distributing the other way around. So this is one of the first points where lattices are really <laughs> very different from things like groups or rings, because it turns out that if one operation distributes over the other one, that that reverse situation has to happen. So there's a real symmetry between the meet and join operations, which doesn't exist between, say, addition and multiplication in a ring. Meet and join are much more similar to each other than addition is to multiplication. Okay, so let's see the proof of this thing that I am, I am so, so very excited to expound on. All right, so, uh, so let's suppose that L is a distributive lattice. Then let's take some X, Y, and Z in L. And just for convenience sake, let's say that A is X join Y. Okay, so now my goal is to show that this identity is true. So let's start off with the right-hand side of this identity. Let's, let's put that over here. So X join Y me X join Z is going to be A because that's just X join Y. So by definition, there's A there, me X join Z. But because we assume that L is distributive, that gives us this, we can distribute this A into this join. And so we get A me, X join A meet Z, okay? And so then, well, A meet X, this is actually X join Y meet X, but then by absorption, that's going to just give us X again, just by the absor absorption law, which must hold in all lattices. So we have X join, X join Y, which was A again, meet Z. Okay, well, if I now use distributivity again, distributing this Z over this join here, and remember that I can do that because meet and join are commutative operations. So having the distributive law on the left-hand side is the same as having it on the right-hand side. Um, so this is, this is unlike the situation with rings where you might consider a non-commutative ring. Here for lattices, they're definitely all, all um, both me and join are commutative operations. So having distributivity on one side means you must have it on the other one. Okay, 
So we get x join x mu z join y mu z by distributing this z over here. So again, we use distributivity down here. All right, so now that we're at this point, and notice that I don't need parentheses on uh, this x join something join something because join is associative. And then we have here x join x meet z. And so by absorption, again, that gives us just x. And so we're left with x join y meet z. But now that's actually the other side of the identity that we wanted to show. So we did this for any x, y, and z at all in our lattice, which means that this identity must hold if L is distributive. In other words, join must distribute over meet when L is a distributive lattice. Now, I claim that the argument in the other direction is identical <laughs> and that you can actually get the same exact, the same exact argument except have it be the one you need in the other direction by swapping all of the, all of the uh, meets with all of the joins everywhere in this argument and vice versa. So uh, you should think about why that actually will work um, and try to make sure that you really understand why if I switch uh, the meet and the join symbols everywhere in this argument, I'll be able to prove that if a lattice satisfies this identity, then it will have to satisfy the, the usual distributive law, which says that meet distributes over join. Okay, so that's another sort of exercise to do. Now let's talk about some examples of non-distributive lattices. We've actually held off on giving examples of um, distributive lattices so far, although you will find uh, that there are very many readily available examples, even if you go and look at some of the examples of lattices we've already discussed on previous days. But uh, in order to develop the theory of the distributive and modular laws a little bit more, we're actually going to need to consider two very special non-distributive lattices. So in order to prepare for, for this, you should examine all non-empty lattices of order at most four. And so remember that the order of an algebraic structure, A, F, where A is our universe and F is our collection of basic operations, this order is nothing but the cardinality of A as a set. It's just the number of elements in the universe. That's the order of our algebra. And so, of course, you can also consider the empty uh, algebra as a lattice if you would like, but uh, that will not be extremely enlightening, probably. <laughs> so you should consider and examine all non-empty lattices of order at most four. There are five such lattices up to isomorphism. And so uh, it also is uh, a little exercise that you should do to actually uh, draw Hasse diagrams for all of those lattices, for all of the smallest possible lattices. They're all distributive, as you can verify. That is, all lattices of order at most four, so orders one, two, three, and four, they're all distributive. I, I suppose the empty lattice is distributive because it's vacuously true that it satisfies a given identity. But again, let's not worry about that one too much. Um, so there are exactly two non-distributive lattices of order five. So five is the first order where we get non-distributive lattices. And we're going to call those two non-distributive lattices M3 and N5. And they're pictured here, as I'm sure you have already <laughs> taken the time to look at as I'm talking at you. So M3 is this lattice here with these uh, five elements depicted by these nodes here in the Hasse diagram. And we also have N5, which has these five nodes here, arranged in this way, according to its Hasse diagram. And so N5 is the pentagon lattice. People, people will call this a uh, pentagon. And it's, uh, it's 
clearly a, a pentagon shape if you look at a tacit diagram. Okay, so M3 is actually modular and N5 is not. So remember that distributive implied modular. So if, uh, so if a lattice is distributive, then it must be modular, but there are non-distributive modular lattices. And this is an example of one. This M3 is an example of a lattice which is modular, but not distributive. Uh, that, so the M presumably stands for modular, and the three, uh, we can actually think of as standing for these three, uh, these three elements here. And the N5 is not distributive or modular, which I suppose explains the N, and the five stands for the pentagon or for the number of elements that it has, although N3, M3, excuse me, M3 also has five elements, so don't let that confuse you. The three is for these three guys here in the middle and not for the number of elements in M3. Okay, so we have these two uh, non-distributive lattices, but what exactly is so special about them besides that they're the smallest, the smallest ones that we can have since all of the lattices of order at most four are distributive? Well, so as we've mentioned a bunch of times before, Dedekind actually did some work on lattice theory around the year 1900. It wasn't called lattice theory at the time. Uh, Dedekind actually referred to what are now called lattices as dual grouping. Excuse my terrible pronunciation. I don't speak German. Um, but uh, he actually did prove some pretty abstract results back in 1900 when he studied uh, lattices, or what would come to be called lattices. So in particular, he showed that in a lattice, L, the following three things are equivalent. One, that L is modular, or A, <laughs> A, L is modular. B, that L satisfies this identity, X meet Z, join Y, meet Z again, is the same as X meet Z, join Y meet Z. And uh, C, L has no sublattice isomorphic to N5, which remember this is the pentagon that we just discussed, whose Hasse diagram looks like a pentagon to the best of my ability to draw a pentagon, which is not, not very much apparently. <laughs> Uh, I just, I can never get this last line. This is the one that's the most challenging for me, I guess. Well, in any case, let's, uh, let's erase that particular embarrassment. Uh, Dedekind showed that these three things are equivalent in 1900. So we have uh, a couple different ways of expressing modularity in addition to the way that we gave at the beginning of this talk. So let's actually go through the argument for this although we won't do it in as much detail. We first show that A implies B. So let's take some X, Y, Z in our lattice, which is modular by assumption, and let's define C to be X meet Z, just for brevity. Well, C is less than or equal to Z because it's X meet Z, and so it must lie below both X and Z. And so we have by modularity, since C is less than or equal to Z, that Z meet Y join C is equal to Z meet Y join C, because modularity says that when C is less than or equal to Z, we can swap these parentheses over to these first two guys here, like this. But if we remember that C is X meet Z, this actually shows that Z meet Y join X meet Z, because C is X meet Z, is equal to z meet y join x meet z. But we can actually do the same thing with any three elements, x, y, and z in our lattice, because the c that we made was just x meet z, and so it didn't really depend on any special assumption on x, y, and z. And so we can actually show that this equality holds for any x, y, and z in our lattice, and that's precisely why we write this squiggly equals <laughs> to say that we have an identity which holds in the lattice L because it's a statement which is true for all X, Y, and Z 
this inequality between these expressions, which is true for all x, y, and z in our lattice. Okay, so that's the A implies B. On the other hand, we would like to show that B implies C, but let's actually show the contrapositive. Let's show that if we don't have C, then we don't have B. So, not, so C being false, means that L does have a sublattice isomorphic to N5. And so we'd like to use that sublattice to show that L must fail to satisfy this identity. So let's suppose that L has a sublattice isomorphic to N5, and let's label the elements of that sublattice like this. So zero is our bottom element, one is our top element, and then Let's label x and z here and y over here so that 0 is below x, is below z, is below 1, and 0 is below y, is below 1. And these five elements are distinct from each other. And as always, my art skills are fairly atrocious as far as drawing by hand is concerned, at least. And so we'll suffer through with this horrifying <laughs> Has a diagram that I've drawn in the margin here. Uh, one can verify that this situation violates the identity in B, where we actually use X for X in this identity, Y for Y, and Z for Z. And you can check that, that, this, that this will fail for, for these, this choice of zero, X, Y, Z, and one. And I'll leave that for you to do. Okay, so now for the last direction, showing that C implies A, we're again going to show the contrapositive. We're gonna suppose that L is not modular, and we're gonna show that L must contain a sublattice isomorphic to N5. So by assumption, there are some elements A, B, and C in L with A greater than or equal to C, so that the direction, okay, so this strict inequality here this is the direction which does not necessarily hold um, for, all, for all lattices. Remember, we always, we always have that, um, okay, so we always, we always have one direction, but we don't always have the other one. And so, um, so this, is, this is the case when, um, this is the case when we don't have modularity. So, Sometimes the direction that's not necessarily true is actually a strict inequality. Okay, so instead of having greater than or equals to here, we just have strictly greater than. All right, so in that case, we know that there are these elements A, B, and C with A greater than or equal to C, so that A meet B join C is strictly greater than A meet B join C. Well, I'm just going to tell you <laughs> that the desired sublattice, which is isomorphic to N5, has the following five elements, which are arranged in the following way. At the bottom is A meet B. At the top is B join C. On the left here, we have C join A meet B. Oh, if I can fit this into the margin here. Okay, here's what I'll do. This element is C meet A join B. This element here is A meet B join C. This Hasse diagram is the same pentagon, which I continue to uh, fail to draw in an aesthetically pleasing way. Oh, look at that. That's just, just shameful. <laughs> and okay. And um, and then on the right-hand side here, we have that the element B sits between A and B and B join C. Okay, so I claim that this is a sublattice of this non-modular lattice L, which is isomorphic to N5. So in order to actually verify that, we need to show that these five elements that I've written down are actually all distinct from each other, first of all because in general, just because I can write down two different expressions in terms of the basic operations of an algebra doesn't mean that they're actually different elements of the algebra in question. 
So first of all, we need to show that these guys are all distinct. So we have five different elements of the lattice. And then we need to show that their meets and joins are such that we do actually have a copy of N5 and not some other five element sublattice, like uh, for example, the five element chain, which just has five elements arranged linearly like so, because that can also happen when you have five distinct elements of some lattice. Okay, so provided that we can show all of that, we have established that not A implies not C, and so C implies A, and we have that these three things are equivalent to each other. So now we have three different characterizations of being a modular lattice. Uh, one is the original definition in terms of that implication. Another one is this identity that we have here. And the third one is that L has no sublattice isomorphic to N5, which is that pentagon, which I find so challenging to draw by hand on my little writing tablet. Okay, so this is what Dedekind did around 1900 and uh, it would sort of lay dormant for a little while until lattice theory became more established during the 1930s, as we talked about uh, last time. Okay, so some more things to point out about this theorem. Even though modularity was not originally defined by an identity, part B shows that it could have been. And so, uh, that means that homomorphic images, sub well, subalgebras, but sublattices, and products of modular lattices are all modular as well, because those um, those constructions all preserve uh, all preserve identities. And so, taking a quotient or a subalgebra or a product of algebras which all satisfy some identity just gives you more algebras that satisfy that same identity. So we also have that uh, since a lattice contains a copy of N5, if and only if it's dual does, and this is just because N5, uh, so remember that the Hasse diagram of N5 uh, is, if the Hasse diagram of N5 is this, well, the Hasse diagram of N5 dual is that one flipped upside down but flipping, uh, flipping this upside down uh, just gives us the same, the same lattice again. And so if this is sitting inside of some, some bigger Hasse diagram, there's some other things going on up here, down here, I don't know, then when we dualize this to get some other lattice L dual, then we're just going to have the same thing, except now it's flipped upside down. And so there still will be a copy of N5 inside of the dual lattice. And so it follows from this and part C of the theorem that L is modular if and only if L dual is. We're gonna refrain from giving an example here, but not all identities which hold in a lattice necessarily hold in its dual. So modularity is special in this regard. Uh, we just haven't given enough examples of identities and lattices yet for you to to see, but examples are readily available. Should one look them out or look them up? Seek them out. That's, that's what I was looking for. All right. So uh, as we mentioned, Birkhoff had a result on distributivity to complement Dedekind's result on modularity in lattices. And so Birkhoff, once he started doing his work, in lattice theory in the 1930s and 40s, produced this result, uh, which says that in a lattice L, the following are equivalent. A, L is a distributive lattice. B, L satisfies this identity, X meet Y, join X meet Z, join Y meet Z, is always the same as X join Y, meet X join Z, meet Y join Z. So in other words, if you have this expression, you can you can just swap all of the meets uh, for joins and vice versa, and you will get uh, something which is equal to it in the lattice in question. So, okay, so distributivity, this identity, and 
L having a no sublattice isomorphic to N5 or M3. So in other words, neither N, N5 nor M3 may appear as a sublattice of your lattice. Those three conditions are equivalent to each other. And so this is a very similar <laughs> result to Dedekind's. Um, and, uh, and the argument for it is actually, um, is actually a bit more involved. And so uh, I, will not, I will not go through it, but uh, it does have a similar flavor. And, um, well, yeah, so, oh, okay, so right. So we won't go through it, but there is also this characterization in terms of, in terms of these, these uh, forbidden sublattices. Now we're using now we're using M three in addition to N five, um, so we also have this characterization. And uh, you might wonder why we would care about producing another identity equivalent to distributivity when we already actually have two different identities that we <laughs> had produced that were both equivalent to being distributed. We had the original one, and then we said, "Oh well, if you dualize it and say that join distributes over meet, that's actually the same." the same thing, that they're equivalent to each other? Well, it turns out that the uh, left and right hand side, uh, these terms in this identity are actually pretty special. So the left and right hand sides of that identity, uh, we can call M1. So let's define M1 to be this X meet Y, join X meet Z, join Y meet Z. That was the left hand side of that identity, which happened to be equivalent to distributivity in lattices. And let's let M2 be the right-hand side, which M2 of X, Y, Z, we can define to be X join Y, meet X join Z, meet Y join Z, for whatever X, Y, and Z we choose. So whether we're looking at M1 or M2, we actually have that M, I, whatever it is, of X, X, Y is always the same as M, I of X, Y, X, is always the same as M, I of Y, X, X, is always the same is X. And so what's happening here is that for either one of these terms, either one of these functions that we can define in terms of meet and join, in terms of meet and join, in, uh, in a lattice, uh, we actually have that this, um, this, this term M is picking out whatever the majority of the entries are here. So if there are more X's than there, are, than there are Y's, then we're going to get that element X. And so uh, for that reason, a term like M1 or M2, which satisfies these identities, is called a majority term because it favors the majority of its arguments. That's very democratic of it, I suppose. <laughs> um, okay. So we uh, won't really we won't really, really get too much into majority terms right now, but on subsequent days, and if you go further on in universal algebra, they will come up a lot more. All right, now I want to end today with a little bit of an aside, maybe kind of a story about graph theory, actually, of all things. So Kuratowski's theorem, it's a classic theorem in graph theory which says that a finite graph is planar if and only if it does not contain a subdivision of either K5, the complete graph on five uh, vertices, or K33, which is the complete bipartite graph, where uh, bipartition of three things and three things, um, as a subgraph. So we have these two forbidden uh, graphs here, K33 and K5, um, and a finite graph is planar if and only if it basically doesn't have a copy of either of these guys inside of it. Maybe it doesn't have to. So the condition of, of having a subdivision is a little weaker, um, but in principle, this is what's happening. You can't really have inside of you topologically a copy of K5 or K33. Um, if you do, you're not planar. If you don't, then you must be. So um, this is a classic result in graph theory, as I said, and it seems really reminiscent of the situation that we encountered in Birkhoff's result, especially for, uh, 
characterizing distributive lattices. Because remember, Birkhoff said that a lattice being distributive was precisely the same as it not containing a copy of M3 or N5, whose Hasse diagrams are pictured here. And so if you look at this and you think about the nature of those results, you'll say this, this looks really, these two things look really similar to each other. Like N5 is a pen pentagon, it, you know, it's Hasse diagram really, you know, looks like K5 superficially. M3, well, there's something to do with three here, and there's three things up here. And it, it seems kind of natural that you might go, well, are these just two special cases of the same thing? Is there some like crazy phenomenon happening where um, there's some sort of rule about forbidden things that applies to both algebra and graph theory? Well, there may be. I don't, I don't know everything there is to know. However, I, um, I did actually once ask the author of the textbook that I'm following right now. So I'm, I've been using, um, as you'll see if you go to the associated website, it still exists on the internet. Um, I've been using Clifford Bergman's Universal Algebra Fundamentals and Selected Topics um, as a guide for this series of lectures. So I once brought this up to Cliff and I said, well, you know, are these things actually related to each other? Like, is this just a superficial similarity or is there something more to it? And he said to me something that um, was, uh, I suppose, both encouraging and discouraging, which is that if I recall correctly, uh, as this was several years ago that this conversation took place, he said that he also had this question at some point when he had started learning about these things himself, and that he didn't know of any, any actual connection beyond the superficial similarity. And so now I'm just throwing this out there as I think this is something that a lot of people who are studying math might notice when they see this result for the first time or see both results. You know, After you've seen both of these results, it's natural to ask it. And um, I'm just throwing it out there that at this point, I don't know an answer, an explanation, and I haven't talked to anyone who does. So uh, that's something to think about, but it might just be a superficial similarity or a coincidence, since I suppose maybe those are allowed to happen in math too. All right, so uh, thanks for sticking it out again with me, you guys. Uh, I hope that you have an awesome rest of your week and I will see you next time. So now just the awkward two seconds before I stop the recording. <laughs>